So welcome all to the second panel of the day. I'm really excited to be participating with such a wonderful set of panelists. I'll let each of them introduce themselves in a little bit more detail, but the topic of today's morning panel is the policy and politics of these issues, which are really very straightforward, and I don't think there's going to be a lot to talk about here because we've really got this thing taken care of. So, of course, I'm, I'm jesting because this is an incredibly complicated landscape, and uh, there are issues at the federal level, at the state level, at the local level, at the institution level that I think we're um, not yet fully incorporating into the toolkit that we have to address the issues on the table. So I'm going to uh, start with letting the panelists give some opening remarks. I'll have some questions myself, and then we'll turn to the audience for Q&A. Uh, to my left is Jens Ludwig, who is the Edwin and Betty L. Bergman Distinguished Service Professor. He's a professor at the Harris School of Public Policy, and he is director of the University of Chicago Crime Lab, among the many things he takes on. To his left is Chris Brown, who's the president of Brady, which united against gun violence, who will have uh, much to bring to the table. And then to her left is Benjamin Gibson, who's the vice president of governmental affairs at the University of Chicago Medicine. So we have represented a wide range of expertise. And I will turn to Jens. Oh, we were going to go the other direction. Oh, we're going to go the other direction. I'm going to turn to Benjamin. OK. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you all for being here today. I uh, really uh, look forward to uh, discussing this very important topic. Uh, just following up on what was said uh, in the previous panel, um, and you all know how important the, the Heller decision was, which was the 2008 Supreme Court decision that um, created the individual right uh, for the first time in American history to uh, carry and maintain a firearm. Um, but even with the Heller decision, and even given the current composition of the Supreme Court, it's clear that there are a wide variety of regulations that, that would likely be upheld at the level of the Supreme Court. And one in particular that I wanted to talk about is the universal background check uh, issue, and um, sort of explore the question of why it is in America that um, legislation or a proposal that enjoys support of about 90% of the American public, sometimes even above 90%, depending on the poll, uh, actually doesn't get enacted into law uh, and, and sort of gives some interesting perspective around the whole politics of gun issues in the United States. So as you know, uh, th there are laws that require background checks when individuals purchase uh, firearms from licensed gun dealers. However, there are many sales uh, that go on in this country uh, in the gun show context or the internet context where background checks don't occur. And uh, the House of Representatives actually took up uh, a, law, a proposed law last year, passed the House, that, that would have uh, imposed universal background checks. And it wasn't actually even close. It was 240 to 190. So strong support from, from the public on this issue and, and fairly strong support in the House of Representatives. So then, of course, there's no vote that uh, occurs in the Senate, and, and this proposal does not uh, become law, as is, as is often the case with, with this sort of thing. Um, and so what, what, are the, what are the reasons uh, for that? And, and I don't have one reason, frankly. I mean, it's a complicated set of issues. But um, there are some thoughts about it. Uh, first, this structure of the Senate, based on how the Constitution sets up the Senate, of course, is not really designed to directly translate public opinion into public policy. Uh, as you know, um, many states with smaller populations uh, have the same representation as the larger state, larger population states. And so many times uh, proposals that enjoy public support um, simply don't get enacted. And the filibuster rule in the Senate now requires 60 votes to bring a matter to vote. It used to be um, 67 votes, so it's been cut down over time. Um, and in fact, there have been other recent changes in the filibuster involving uh, appointments, particularly judicial appointments, where the, the, the filibuster rule has essentially been eliminated, so you only need a majority. Um, within the next decade, you know, there's a decent prospect, I think, that, uh, and there's no guarantee of this, this is somewhat 
uh, speculative, but uh, there's a decent prospect that we're going to move uh, away from that 60 vote threshold. I think we, we've seen uh, a transition occurring just in recent years, first with federal uh, judicial appointments, then Supreme Court appointments, and there seems to be a growing sentiment that uh, that this is something that could happen, you know, given uh, g given changes that may occur in the Senate in this decade. So certainly, if that were to occur, the politics of gun regulation would shift fairly substantially, uh, potentially. Um, the importance uh, of elections, I mean, this is sort of an obvious point, but it may be important to make in the context of this discussion of the politics of gun regulation. The importance of elections can't really be overstated. Um, the 2000 election, very close election, as, as you recall, came down to a, you know, a small number of votes. Had that gone differently, um, we probably wouldn't have the Heller decision. We would, we would have some very different landscape. So um, uh, not to simplify the politics around this, it's obviously a complicated issue, but uh, elections uh, matter. And, uh, and certainly if you look at, say, the, you know, the, the Biden proposals versus the Trump proposals in terms of what kind of regulations would occur, what kind of uh, action might uh, occur uh, via executive order or other um, uh, action that could be taken by the president uh, on his own initiative, you know, there could be very uh, significant, if not dramatic, changes in what the public policy is. Um, so I think we would, you know, we would um, uh, focus also on, um, you know, I do a lot of work in Springfield uh, as part of my job for the medical center. Uh, as you all know, we have a, a level one trauma center here at our medical center, and you'll hear more about some of the medical aspects and implications of that in the next panel. But certainly we have a strong interest in the uh, public health issues related to gun violence. Um, we have a, unfortunately, very busy trauma center here and a very significant percentage of the trauma cases we see are, are gun violence cases. Uh, Illinois is a um, so-called shall issue state, uh, meaning that uh, one can apply for uh, a license uh, to uh, own and possess a gun. Um, there are certain restrictions, you know, certain criminal background um, prohibitions that apply, and uh, law enforcement has an authority, you know, has the opportunity to weigh in with objections to issuance. But in general, if you submit the form, if you don't have uh, uh, certain criminal background disqualifications, you undergo a fairly uh, minimal amount of training. Um, you will be you will be issued uh, the the card and you will be able to uh, possess and maintain that weapon in in Illinois. Um, we are not an open carry state, as you know. Uh, uh, unlike uh, you may have been in some states, like I was in Texas recently. You go to a basketball game there, people line up and and literally like check their guns, you know, before they go into the arena. So so we don't have that climate in Illinois, but we we certainly do have a climate where um, uh, under current law. Um, most individuals are, are uh, entitled to, uh, to to own weapons and carry them even in their cars as long as they're you know in the trunk and not not loaded things like that. Um, so I will pass it along to the next speaker and uh, get get your perspective on the issue. Thank you so much. I'm Chris Brown. I'm the president of Brady. Brady is one of the nation's oldest gun violence prevention organizations. Uh, named, obviously, after Jim and Sarah Brady. Jim and Sarah joined a pre-existing organization, a local organization, after Jim Brady was shot because they wanted to try and make the world safer and prevent the kind of shooter who shot John, shot Jim Brady, John Hinckley, um, from getting guns in the future. It seemed like a simple proposition at the time, but it took six years and seven votes in Congress before the Brady Law was ultimately enacted just a bit more than a quarter century ago today. And of course, that law is the national law that requires a background check before gun sales. Why, in response to Ben's comment then, is uh, federal legislation necessary to close the loopholes that we have in the law? Because a quarter century ago, when the Brady Law was enacted, the internet was not a thing, and gun shows were not big business, but today they are. And as a result, about one in five guns sold today is sold with no background check at all. I live in the state of Virginia, 
um, thank goodness, we, elections do matter. Um, and we've recently passed a number of bills in the legislature that the governor will sign, including a bill, I hope, that will expand the Brady Law there. But just to contextualize what this means, there's a site called armslist.com, and every once in a while from my home in Arlington, Virginia, I go on it, because when I go to testify at places like the Crime Commission in Virginia that met before the last election, I want legislators to know just how porous the rules are right now. now I can go on armslist.com and I can click a box called private seller and I can ask how many AR-15s are for sale within a 30 mile radius of my home. I did this about four months ago and about 26 assault style weapons were featured up to me. Many of the advertisements said for sale, no questions asked, cash transactions. This is the problem that we have right now that could be fixed very easily if the bill HR 8 that had passed the House last year was passed by the Senate. So obviously, as our namesake and an organization that understands what kind of policies can make a difference, Brady continues to advocate for the expansion of the Brady Law, both at the federal level and in the absence of action that at the state level too, and over 20 states have now expanded the Brady Law to ensure that gun sales cannot occur in those states without a background check at gun shows and over the internet. But obviously we live in contiguous states, so the need mainly, the need for federal action is very, very clear in this area. There are a variety of other areas I hope we can get into in terms of policy that are very, very important at the federal level. For us at Brady, one of the three main priorities are expansion of the Brady Law to, uh, to have a federal standard to close these loopholes, expansion and support of states through money and grants to enact extreme risk laws these laws were referenced on the prior panel, but these are laws that allow a temporary court order to remove guns from individuals who are at risk of harming themselves or others. Some states in, have adopted these laws and have a historical record around them. Connecticut has one of the oldest, longest standing extreme risk laws in effect. And what they found in a study that was done a couple of years ago is a significant decrease in suicide rates in that state, all other things being equal, in part because the folks at risk, often associated with these orders, are at risk of self-harm as much as harm to others. And the third area Brady is really advocating is restrictions on high capacity magazines and assault weapons. Brady has a long history of supporting state and local actors who adopt these kinds of laws, and in every instance where we have supported and defended those laws, courts have held them entirely constitutional. The policy work that we're doing is also at the state level. Obviously, it's not just about these kinds of measures. We also have to ensure that we have robust, much more robust systems for the sale of guns across our country. This was also alluded to in the prior panel. What we know, and admittedly this is old data, because the ATF hasn't given us fresh data, but we, what we know from an ATF report of about 20 years ago is that about 5% of gun dealers are responsible for the sale of 90, 90% of crime guns. And those are the guns that are flooding many communities across this country, especially black and brown communities, and significantly increasing rates of violence in those communities. Brady is working with states to try and pass laws to add state police powers, not just the ATF to inspect these gun dealers because they're not doing a great job of it, but to enhance the inspection regime to allow state police to also inspect those gun dealers. Illinois passed a law to require that that's still being implemented. So there are a variety of things that we're also advocating that we think are really important that are simply enforcement mechanisms. 
Brady believes we have to work across Congress, certainly in the courts, and in communities if we want to tackle the epidemic of gun violence. We view gun violence as a public health epidemic, and certainly by any standard and norm, it is one. We have 114,000 roughly on average people shot in the United States every single year. About 40,000 of those individuals, Americans, are dying every single year. We've lost more Americans to gun violence since 1970 than we've lost soldiers in all of America's wars combined. And I look forward to talking a little bit more about how it is that actually on many of these measures I've talked about, if you look at the public opinion polls, whether you're in a red state or a blue state, a Republican or a Democrat, you support these measures. What we're finding is obviously a problem in the Senate, the US Senate right now, um, getting a lot of things done, frankly. But certainly gun violence is one of the ones that's most acute because you don't have that many issues where you have such a strong number, a huge percentage of the population saying, yes, we want this to happen, and an action still occur. I will close, though, on a hopeful note, which is, as, as Sarah Brady always used to say, when you can't change the laws, you change the lawmakers. And that's what we've been doing. And we've been very busy, not just us, but a variety of amazing organizations in the gun violence prevention space. I would say, especially post-Parkland, the tragedy in Parkland, with the creation of March for Our Lives, the number of young people now engaged in this cause, who rank this cause, this issue, as a top priority, and one that is deeply personal to them, helped make a huge difference. In 2018, we elected to the US House of Representatives a gun violence prevention majority, the first time in a generation. And they have made a huge difference, including getting CDC funding of 25 million, which we're very proud of. Actually, it's split between the CDC and NIH. We also are seeing that kind of change at the state level. Right? As a Virginian, I know none of these bills that were a governor's priority since 2017 would be getting passed if Virginians hadn't gone to the ballot box in 2019 and elected, probably for the first time since the House of Burgesses was created in Virginia, a gun violence prevention in majority in my own state of Virginia, both in the House and the Senate. So while the policy is very important, I think that what's clear about our movement is that it's not just policy, elections matter. And finding more candidates who don't just talk about the issue if asked the question, but who will run, lead, and win on this issue is critically important. We've worked a lot with all of the presidential candidates who are, who are running, now it's winnowed field on the Democratic side, but what you saw is really candidates competing against each other to put more bold, more detailed, more comprehensive plans together than we have ever seen in any presidential race in history. We're very proud of that. We think that's the direction things are going. And I look forward to questions. Great, thanks. Um, I wanted to make three points that uh, I think build on the uh, previous comments. The first is um, if you look at most of the public conversation and the attention around gun violence in the United States, it is devoted to the issue of gun control. And so I wanted to just take a minute to talk about why that has so much value and uh, so much natural appeal. Because in many ways, you can think of it as an attempt to have a wholesale solution to the gun violence problem with a single stroke of a legislative pen, we can address a lot of these sorts of problems. In January, I was at a conference um, in London at the University of College of London where uh, Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London, stood up and said, uh, lethal violence in London is the number one priority to every Londoner, and this is a crisis, and this is his top priority. And uh, as he was speaking, I went on my laptop and I looked at the homicide rate in London and compared it to my home city of Chicago, and their homicide rate is 10% of Chicago's. 
And then I, I wondered, uh, well, maybe the difference can be explained by the fact that the English are somehow more civilized or more occupied than Americans. They're all having tea and crumpets in the afternoon at the British Museum, who has time to engage in anything else. And what you see is when you look at overall rates of violent crime in London compared to American cities, they're really not different. The one big difference between places like London and places like Chicago is not the number of assaults or robberies, but rather the number of homicides. And that difference is due entirely to gun homicides in the United States. And so almost all of the homicides that Sadiq Khan is worried about are committed with knives. So if you're coming from the Chicago perspective, you would say a homicide rate that is 10% of Chicago's current rate that includes almost no gun homicides does not look like a crisis, but rather a nearly unimaginable success. So you can see why we are so focused on legislative change. That's the, uh, the first point uh, that I wanted to make. The second point is to just say a little bit more building on the previous comments about why that's so difficult in the United States. And I think the structural issues around the Senate is one reason, but not the only reason. Um, about 20 years ago, a guy named John Lott wrote a book uh, about gun control in the United States, and you could get a sense for where he was going with his conclusions from the title of the book, which was More Guns, Less Crime. And uh, I got invited to the Minnesota State Legislature uh, in January for some legislative hearing, and it was about minus 200 degrees Fahrenheit, um, and it was snowing, and I was uh, hoping the plane didn't crash in the blizzard, and, and I finally land, and I, I go into the... Um, hearing room, and it's jam-packed with people. Jam-packed with people, about 100% of whom were there to support John Lott. And so I think it is, on the one hand, true that when you look at the opinion polls, there's very broad support for gun control. But when you look at the level of energy and activism in the legislative process, unfortunately, or depending on your political preferences, the empirical reality seems to be that people who are opposed to additional gun, uh, gun regulations tend to be much more energized. So in economics and political science, we would call this the collective action problem. And so I think it's not merely the, the Senate structural issues. There's something deeper here as well. So then you might ask yourself, well, once you recognize that federal law sets a floor rather than a ceiling on gun laws in the United States, why don't we simply uh, get out of the federal political box by doing things at the city and the state level? And when you look around the country, there has, in fact, been lots of policy innovation by cities and states to supplement the federal laws. And this goes back to the point that Chris made, which is, you know, there are no legal gun stores in Chicago right now. All of our crime guns come from Indiana, Mississippi, Cook County suburbs. We're living in a world in which uh, the, this just amplifies what you said before, it's enormously difficult for cities and states to unilaterally regulate their way out of this problem in a world in which we have open borders for cities and states. Now, there are some things that can be helpful, but all of the local and state attempts to regulate their way out of this problem fly into this headwind of, of open borders, and it's just enormously difficult. So I think, uh, the wholesale approach would be enormously valuable if we could figure out a way to do this uh, effectively. The current politics in the United States just make that enormously difficult. So the third thing that I wanted to say is that uh, I think we are not giving enough attention to what cities and states can do on their own to address this problem not just at a wholesale level through regulation, but at a retail level as well, through things like uh, smart attempts at uh, leveraging existing criminal justice system resources, police and other parts of the criminal justice system, and smart attempts at using social policy to also reduce gun, gun violence. And I think that is, uh, I think it has to be a much more important part of our national strategy to reduce gun violence moving forward, to see real big changes in the short term. The challenge with that is the play, that it requires resources 
in a way that changing gun laws doesn't necessarily uh, always require resources. And if you think about the places around the United States that are most severely afflicted by gun violence, it is places like Chicago, Detroit, Baltimore, St. Louis. It's jurisdictions that on their own are not necessarily swimming in resources. And so, and they are, for better or for worse, under the existing system, largely on their own, addressing this problem financially, as well as through regulatory measures as well. And so I think that's gotta be much more important, but we have to figure out this other piece of the, the puzzle that I think just doesn't get nearly as, as much attention as it needs to in the conversation. So you've all raised a number of really important threads to follow up on. Uh, one I wanted to start with is, is where you ended, but came up in many of the other conversations. The more guns, more crime, more guns, less crime. You know, inherently, this is an empirical question. You can tell a story where if everybody has a gun, then no one can do anything bad. Or you can tell a story where the more guns there are, the more homicides, suicides, et cetera. Um, you all are much more expert in the evidence. But my reading of the evidence is that it is fairly clear that more guns equals more crime and more harm. At the Harris School and at the University of Chicago, we like to think that evidence informs policy and that <laughs> having, having information nice like that could yeah. be a, a key input to better decision making. But yet this disconnect remains. And so I would love to hear your thoughts about how as generators of evidence, we can make it more effective and how then policy can be designed to draw on a more solid evidence base in informing outcomes. Yeah, I, I mean, I think first, you know, the the intensity issue is, is part of this. So, um, you know, down in Springfield every year, many different groups and organizations come to Springfield to present their case to legislators. Typically every year, the biggest group, the biggest rally, where they actually close down the streets of Springfield because there's so many people is the gun, gun lobby. And so even though there is the evidence and the opinion, public opinion that may support a lot of these changes, um, there, there is an intensity to the, the uh, support for uh, gun rights. And, and I don't know exactly you know, how that relates to the intensity on the other side. You have a, a sense of that. But um, you know, from what I see, the, there's an intensity level that, um, that um, determines a lot of these outcomes regardless of the public opinion. So, and, and I want to come back to that question of intensity of views. And there's room for people to have different priorities about which rights they think are more important and all that. But is it, before we even get to that, is there genuine disconnect or uh, mm -hmm. dispute about the magnitude of the effect of having more guns before you get to the point of what you prioritize more? There is genuine dispute, dispute about that. Um, well, there's dispute about it. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's a fine distinction. <laughs> right, because we know John Lott Lat well, for example. Um, Jens referenced him. He's someone who often is the witness testifying on behalf of gun rights principles if there are hearings on Capitol Hill. And most every data point that he has used and every piece of quote unquote research that he has published has been soundly debunked as not based on fact. And the data that we do have overwhelmingly says, to your point, more guns are not making us safer. In the states that have the highest proportion of gun ownership, you see the highest level of gun violence. And I should note a piece of this that is very, very tragic. I was just listening to an incredible podcast about this yesterday, is that suicide by gun comprises 60% of all gun deaths in this country. That is a huge and growing problem. It's especially acute in the vets community where about 20 veterans every day are ending their lives by suicide. It's particularly acute among white men between the ages of 45 and 65. And in those states with the highest gun ownership, you also see, consistent with these other kinds of gun violence, huge rates of suicide. 
compared to the rest of the country. So the facts are with us. It's a good place to be. The facts have always been with us. What I think the movement as a whole, and I'm relatively newer to this movement, I've been with Brady now for three years, what we have not always done a terrific job on, I think we're doing better, is framing the message. That's very, very important. And historically, I would agree with Ben that there has been what I call, what political scientists call, a, an intensity gap, where individuals will say, you know what, gun violence prevention is really, really important to me. I wish my state would pass these laws. But they hadn't necessarily ranked the issue as a top priority issue. Maybe it was in their top 10, but if it was, it was in the lower third. That's changed. And the really notable thing is, from the polls that I've seen over the last year, where it's changed and it's mm -hmm. stayed very, very high, is particularly for the age group of 18 to 35. And I think the reasons for that, in part, are the reasons why March for Our Lives spurred so many people, younger people, to become engaged, which is, this is the generation that experienced lockdown drills as an everyday reality. I have a 16 and your 18 year old, they have their fourth lockdown drill at school. So this isn't an esoteric issue. And so I think the intensity that we're now bringing, but also the messaging, <clears throat> because facts don't matter in the end if you are not appropriately messaging the issues and helping people understand, this isn't about going in and confiscating your guns, right? None of these policies I've talked about call for that. Everything that we're talking about actually is consistent with the Second Amendment. And putting that off the table is actually quite important. To be able to have a dialogue around these issues is very important. I, uh, I just wanted to add something to um, Kate's question of the degree to which the evidence has or has not been helpful on this. And you know, I think that the my reading of the evidence is that it's fairly clear that on net more private gun ownership leads to more homicides. But uh, I think that there is a nuance behind that that we're having a very difficult time having an intellectually honest conversation about that leads it, I think, to be less persuasive to, uh, to the public than it could be otherwise. And, and here's what I think the nuance is. If I'm making a decision about whether I should own a gun myself, um, there is some private benefit to me in principle from self-defense and self-protection, some risk that someone within the home will use the gun in an unauthorized way, or I might use the gun in, uh, you know, in a moment of, of a bad decision. And then there are a bunch of uh, potential, so there's some positive potential externality from that or benefit from deterrence, if burglars are thinking that people have guns in their homes, they might start to think twice. But then there are also possible negative spillovers to other people as well. Now, you know, something like 500,000 guns get stolen out of American homes every year, and that's a lot of guns. And millions and millions of guns get resold on the secondary market, as Chris mentioned, without any sort of background check. That's a problem that's directly proportional to the number of guns that we have in private hands. And I think a lot of the, the conversation around the evidence right now has the flavor of, so you can see whatever your sort of political view on this, conceptually there are some things that are on your side, some things that are on the other side. And I think a lot of the conversation has the flavor of denying <coughs> that anything might be going against you. And so, like, so I, again, I think on net, more guns are leading to more homicides, but a lot of the conversation then takes another step to say, and we know that guns actually don't make you safer yourself, that getting gun, and there I think uh, the case control, there's, not to get too nerdy into the research weeds, but I think the evidence that making a gun, that owning a gun makes you personally less safe is still very much an open question. It's a very, very difficult question to answer, right? And I think that still is very much an, an open question. And we can see in newspaper accounts that people really do use guns in self-defense. Sometimes. The number of, of self-defense uses of guns every year is not zero. We know that from looking at, at police data. 
So I think when we have a conversation that denies that there are any possible benefits to people from having guns, it undercuts the legitimacy of the larger and I think ultimately much more important claim that on net, like yes, there are some benefits to some people, maybe from having a gun for self-protection, but on net, the, the negative spillovers to everyone else make this a bad idea from a societal perspective, and on net, we might want to be in a situation that looks a lot more like the United Kingdom than the United States. But I think because we can't quite talk through that nuance of sort of gross benefits but net costs, I think we're not able to use the evidence in a credible and convincing way to kind of bring people along. It's my hypothesis. I, I think that's a really good point. I mean, I think it sort of relates to what I was talking about before, which is how we talk about how we frame these issues. Yes, there may be rare circumstances in which you have a gun on you at just the right time uh, to defend yourself from the studies that I've read. It's actually the threat of potentially having a gun that has a more uh, positive effect than actual use of the gun itself. And there's very, very limited circumstances and data that I've seen about the successful use. I have seen all of the data about the fact that if you have a gun in the home in a domestic violence situation, the partner who is abused is 500 times more likely to be shot. I know about the risks of a gun in the home associated with unintentional injury of children. Eight kids a day are killed or injured with a gun in the home. We looked at this at Brady about two years ago, recognizing the very point that you're making, Jens, which is if you talk about this and just throw data at people, it's not going to ultimately necessarily convince them because they have this gut instinct especially if they feel at risk, well, maybe I should have a gun. I think that the way to frame a lot of these conversations is understanding that may well be the feeling the person has. But think about the term designated driver, right? Think about the term secondhand smoke. What kinds of issues were they trying to get at there? Why were those terms created? We at Brady sat back about two years ago and said, we have to come up with a term for people bringing a gun into the home with the view that this will absolutely protect them, but not thinking about those risks. So the term we came up with is family fire on purpose because it's very similar to friendly fire. That's a term when you're in combat and you shoot unintentionally someone on your same side. And so this campaign has been out there for about 18 months and it's talking directly to gun owners and individuals considering the purchase of a gun. And it's not saying there's no reason whatsoever, there's no, no basis, I won't use the term rational, there's no basis for you to purchase a gun. What it's saying is we know you have one and you may not be getting rid of it, or we know you're considering it, but you have to think about the risks and you have to exercise safe storage. I think that's how we can better balance the, the interests here and also meaningfully save lives. So, so following up on this issue of finding common ground and framing, you mentioned suicide and my understanding of the evidence is that there is a pretty solid evidence base that access to a firearm dramatically increases the successful suicide rate, that it is... Um, I think there are arguments that people will find alternative means, but the evidence suggests that, in fact, the ready availability of a handgun substantially increases the net rate. And this is something that gun owners and, and people who operate gun ranges have been a little more cooperative on engaging in across the aisle or across the political divide as, as a common ground. What are mechanisms that you've seen as successful to bridging that divide. The, the family fire is a great example. Suicide prevention may fall into that category, but the talking across purposes about competing rights seems to dominate the political discourse these days. So how, how can we help add mechanisms for bridging those divides? You know, the... the, the one um, 
One point that immediately comes to mind for me is uh, if you look at what um, you know, sports shooting organizations and the NRA and other uh, gun owner organizations say, almost all of them endorse uh, what you would think of as like basic non-controversial principles of safe gun storage. So guns should be stored, the ammunition should be separate from the weapon, um, the firearm should be kept locked up. Uh, and uh, maybe 20 years ago, I worked on a uh, survey of national gun owners with uh, my friend Phil Cook at Duke. And what we found is a very large share of actual gun owners in practice keep their guns stored, loaded, and unlocked. And it's, it's a little bit hard to tell from survey data exactly why, but as best we could tell in the survey, it seems, uh, it seems like it's related to people's idea that they're gonna need access to the gun very quickly for self-defense. Now, I think this goes back a little bit to what you said before, Chris. Like, setting aside the question of how many times people wind up needing a gun in self-defense every year, the fraction of those cases where you need a gun instantly, right. where there's not enough time to unlock the gun, right. is, I don't want to say zero, but uh, vanishingly small. Right. And so that creates, in principle, an opportunity, right? Because there you, at least in principle, there should be an alignment of interest, yeah. right? Like you are actually not doing something that is increasing public safety and you are creating these massive risks to everyone in your family. And you know, if you were gonna think about a starting point for common ground, that doesn't seem like a bad place to start to me. I, yes, I agree with that. I, I do think that in terms of policy, there are policies that are on the table that states are considering. We have child access prevention laws, for example, that would put penalties in place for failing to engage in certain safe storage practices. There are also incentives that you can create, tax incentives, for example, and there's legislation pending in the House right now, which has the most bipartisan co-sponsors of any gun violence prevention bill, at least at the beginning stages, that has been had, which would incentivize gun owners to, uh, to uh, purchase safe storage by giving tax incentives back associated with that. What we found in the research associated with rolling out the family fire campaign in our discussions with gun owners, and now we're talking a lot in specific to the veterans community. We just finished a major survey to, to do our next round of creative, is that many gun owners who have a long history in their families, for example, of hunting, um, you know, long track record with guns, really believe in the elements of safe storage and do engage in those elements and view them as a critical part of the heritage and the responsibility of gun ownership. So while I do think policy here is very important, we also believe that reframing what it is to be a responsible gun owner and having that be a social norm around safe storage is absolutely imperative. Sorry, can I just add one other thing to this too, which I yeah. didn't, I think the, the other part of the safe storage point that I think uh, really is just incredibly important, like there's the, the risk of unsafe storage to people in the home. But as I mentioned before, there are half a million guns stolen out of American homes every year, right? Those guns by hands, by definition, are going directly into the hands of criminals, right? And that is related to how these guns are stored. And I yes. think including that in the messaging in terms of why this is so important, I think could also be, I agree. be part of this. Yeah. So there are a number of public policies that you've all alluded to from who has guns and background checks to the way they're stored. And then there's a panoply of other closely related things in public health, in hospitals, you know, thinking about the trauma center and the role of the healthcare system in addressing the public health crisis of gun violence. You know, how does the presence of a trauma center play into that and what yeah. spillover, positive spillover effects can that have? Yeah, so we, we have had uh, recent experience here at the university, as you know, opening a, a, an adult uh, level one trauma center recently in the last couple of years. And uh, certainly um, that was in response to a great need here in this community. 
And um, uh, as you'll hear in the next panel with uh, Dr. Rogers and others, um, you know, this is a very busy trauma center and we would like to not only treat the victims of trauma, but uh, interact with uh, people in the trauma center in ways that can help prevent some of this, or at least reduce some of the violence going forward. So we've actually instituted um, some very significant programs over in the medical center, um, dealing with violence prevention, violence interruption, so that um, uh, people who come in who are victims of trauma, either directly or family members, friends, et cetera, um, have social service interventions available. Because many times, you know, it, the same individual will come in uh, injured by gunfire, you know, multiple times in, in a short period of time. I mean, believe it or not, you know, there are, there are many repeat cases. So to the extent that we can intervene um, with, uh, you know, people who can talk, talk to the, the, the violence victims, uh, arrange necessary social service interventions. In some cases, we actually arrange for people to literally move out of a, of a particular community because it's just too dangerous for them to go back to the same, you know, residence uh, because of various, um, you know, issues that are going on. So um, obviously we would like to see, in, 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 you know, in general, fewer uses of illegal guns in the community, but, you know, we think we can do things that would contribute to that through our interventions in the, in the trauma center. So, so you're highlighting a key touch point, a moment to intervene in what could be a very bad trajectory. And uh, Jens, I know the crime lab works hard at the earliest moments to try to find interventions that can stop this kind of cycle and find the moment, especially for young people that can <coughs> have lifetime benefits. What, what's some of the evidence on that? What types of programs do you think work? Yeah. Where's the most successful intervention? Yeah, I, I think um, my, my thinking about the gun violence problem was, uh, shaped a lot by looking at the data, but also in a visit to the juvenile detention center here in Chicago on the west side of the city on Roosevelt Road. We were uh, inside the facility talking to one of the uh, staff leaders. And he, this is him saying this now, me recounting what he was saying. He said, you know, 20% of the kids in here are dangerous. If you let them out, they're gonna hurt people. They need to be detained. This is him saying this, and he said, but the other 80%, I always tell them, if I could give you back 10 minutes of your lives, you wouldn't be here. And I think that that, you know, I think that's something that we've been seeing over and over again in, uh, in the data, that a lot of, even the most serious violence that we have in Chicago and other American cities, really does start to look a lot like, not necessarily bad people, but normal people making bad decisions in the moment. And if you have that frame on what's driving a lot of the problem, it starts to open the door to a bunch of solutions that you don't normally think about. And so I think, you know, one of the things that we've been trying to do with the city is to try and use insights from behavioral science to help prepare people in advance to know how to more successfully navigate these critical 10 minute windows when they confront them. There's a different way to, to do this, which is, or not mutually exclusive, but a complementary way to do this, which is to think about having other people around and available to step in when those 10-minute events happen. And part of that is through things like violence interruption. And part of that also, if you think about those critical 10-minute windows, the, you know, metaphorical 10-minute windows, it's also after someone's been shot because we know a lot of the violence that's happening on the south side of Chicago, the west side of Chicago, Baltimore, St. Louis, on and on, is through retaliation. And I think trauma centers have an incredibly important part to play in thinking about how we kind of productively unwind that in the moment. And how do those interventions depend on partnerships with local law enforcement? Yeah, it's... Uh, you know, I think that one of the key one of the key challenges with so as I said before, we're unfortunately we're massively resource constrained in trying to do things like this. So Chicago has one of the worst unfunded pension obligations in the country. Illinois has one of the worst unfunded pension obligations of any state in the country, and the federal government has its own budget disaster. 
So there's not a lot of free money that's going to be flowing to solve this problem. And so targeting resources on the people who would benefit from them the most become really critically important for turning the limited dollars that we have in a population level, population health impact. And unfortunately, a lot of the, a lot of the people who would benefit the most from, uh, from preventive programming are people who have not necessarily been served particularly well by existing institutions, by their local public schools, by other neighborhood institutions, and you know, and partly that's due to lots of economic dis disadvantage and other challenge in these, these neighborhoods. But nonetheless, we can see in the data that a lot of the people who are at highest risk for gun violence involvement are not necessarily the ones who are voluntarily beating down the, the door to sign up to participate in social programming. And so I think what we found is that law enforcement, if you can successfully figure out a way to do this, law enforcement knows a lot about who the people at highest risk are because unfortunately they have repeated contact with the criminal justice system over and over again. We should be trying to think about a way to use that not just as a time when society drops the hammer on people, but as an opportunity, as a touch point to try and connect people to services that are gonna reduce the likelihood that they come back. And so between the medical system and the criminal justice system, we've gotta figure out a way to connect that with the preventive. We don't normally think of those as kind of launching pads for social policy prevention, but I think they're just absolutely critical. I, I think Jens is making a really important point. The one thing that I think is just an important backdrop to this conversation and the last panel I think got to this a little bit is the focus of most of our laws including now have really been on this idea that was not started with the crime bill but was really kind of doubled down in the crime bill which is a philosophy that some people are just born more violent and then if you put them away you're going to stop the violence and what we're finding in places like Chicago and it's not unique in a lot of other communities across the country is that's just not true. There may be people who are often repeat offenders, but in order to really solve the problem, you have to get at the root cause, and locking people away is not really the right solution to this problem. A better solution, and one that should work, is eliminating the oversupply of crime guns into these communities. That is absolutely critically important and the kinds of violence interdiction programs like ceasefire and many others that have been invested in in far greater number in the last five or six years, which is very, very important, to actually really try to redirect folks into other areas and give a leg up. Ultimately, for us, the, the opportunity is huge, but right now we think from a public policy standpoint, at least at the federal level, the focus on lock them up has created situations, especially for the police, where many of these communities aren't even calling the police when things happen. There is a huge distrust of the police, and there's a lot of different reasons for that. So I think when we think about policy, investments in these hospital-based interventions and uh, treatment of the really the post-traumatic stress that individuals are experiencing, families are experiencing, and entire communities are experiencing, and giving the opportunity to talk about it and understand what options are available is really, really important. So now I'd like to give those in the audience a chance to ask questions. There are some microphones in the back, so please uh, step up introduce yourself and, and pose a question. Hi, my name is Maureen. I work with the Illinois Department of Children and Family Services. And I heard a conversation regarding children that are 18 and under in terms of the impact of gun violence. Um, I want to know in terms of uh, more user-friendly strategies, you mentioned one um, in terms of the friendly fire, but are there other strategies that we could use in terms of reducing the rates of the violence toward the children or even with children in their own homes being shot? 
you know, there has to be some additional ways that we really could help families protect their children in their own home. Uh, speaking for, for Brady, thank you for the question. I, I think that obviously for us, family fire um, and making sure that we have, that, that's a national advertising campaign, by the way. The term is very important, and having ads out there in the public are very important. But that's, that's not going to truly help that situation. What we're driving is safe storage, and so we need partners who are actually interacting with families where they live and talking to them about this issue. So our, what we're very focused on at Brady is we can't do this alone. Ultimately, in order to get families, get parents really engaged in understanding the risks, we need folks like the National Conference of Social Workers that have partnered with us on this campaign to be trained and when they're entering homes, understand how to have the conversation about the risks of loaded and unlocked guns in the home and have a relationship with the members of the family where they can actually really help them understand those risks and how to mitigate the risks. I think there are tremendous additional partnerships with other trusted community members that could work similarly, but it takes an investment in training and the appropriate ways to interact around this issue. I'm really looking forward to hearing from the next panel because I think the healthcare community has a tremendous amount more that they can do to really make a difference around this issue, but we have to start the conversations and it involves talking about guns. And for some people, even in the medical community, that is very hard to do. Sorry, can, can I just add one friendly amendment to this, which is the, uh, one of the other things that Phil Cook and I saw in the survey data on gun ownership in the United States is, um, you know, they they call households and then they randomly pick one of the adults in the home to uh, to talk to. And sometimes you get a married man in the home, and sometimes you get a married woman. And what we see when we ask questions about whether there's a gun in a home is that I think there was something like a 10 or 15 percentage point difference in responses between married men and married women uh, in terms of whether there's a gun in the home. And so part of this also, women saying less likely to be a gun in the home. So one, one hypothesis, right? It's hard to know exactly what that is. But one hypothesis is that there's a bunch of families with gun in the homes where there's not even a conversation among the family members about that. And that also seems like that would be a you know, enormously helpful to figure out how to facilitate those conversations within the home. Yeah, that, that's a really, really, thank you for that question. And, you know, we also have a level one pediatric trauma center here at the University of Chicago. And those are important conversations that do occur uh, in, the, in the emergency room at our children's hospital. Uh, the importance of safe storage of weapons. Uh, you know, many children, I'm sure you've heard, you know, some of these stories that we have in our community here, just sad stories where you will ask a class of fifth graders how many know someone who's been shot, you know, and most hands in the class will go up. And we see many kids in our emergency room who have been shot, oftentimes in sort of accidental situations. I mean, they're, they're, they're non-accidental cases, but there are certainly many accidental cases as well. And um, that's, those are conversations that occur on a regular basis where you're not only treating the injury and hopefully you know, getting past the medical, uh, immediate medical crisis, but when the kid goes home, trying to promote a safer environment for the child based on discussions with you know, the parents. Most of the gun homicides in cities like Chicago occur from illegally possessed and illegally carried guns. So I wonder what you think about police policies or tactics like stop, question, and frisk. A lot of civil rights activists have uh, gutted those policies because of their disparate impact, but homicides, gun homicides have a disparate impact on minorities. So I wonder how, uh, well, one, uh, are stop and frisk policies effective and two, how would you modify them, perhaps with police training, uh, to have police have uh, more interactions with people 
under circumstances where they could uh, find out what people are doing and, and then eventually make some judgment about whether they may be carrying an illegal weapon. Do you want to go first? Or not? I'm not a supporter of stop and frisk as a policy. I think we, we talked about this, and I tried to touch on it uh, previously, which is um, the focus for a long time has been on the trigger pullers in our public policy. From our perspective, we should be focusing on the gun dealers that are fueling that criminal market. And most of those guns, from the studies that we've seen, and hopefully Jens can weigh in on this, start in, in a, uh, a gun owner shop of some kind. They don't just end up on the criminal market. Of course, the problem with theft from homes is a huge and growing one. Jens has referenced that. But ultimately, if we want to really make a material difference, we have to go to the source. And if we can target the 5% of gun dealers that are responsible for 90% of crime guns in our communities, we could make a big difference. There are some reasons why that's not happening well. In the last panel, they talked about the TRT amendments. Those are a series of amendments that have restricted the ATF from telling us exactly who those gun dealers are. That's why we want that to be reversed but we also want more states to do what Illinois has done, what New Jersey has done, what California has done, we hope many more will do, which is to get the state police the appropriate oversight so that they can inspect the gun dealers that are in their communities and go after the ones that are truly fueling the, the crime gun problem. And I think much more of our resourcing and policy should be focused on that to solve the problem. Yeah, there, there's something a little bit weird about the conversation about in, enforcement against gun violence where, you know, if you look at the national conversation, there are a bunch of people that say that public safety is so important that we need to turn the police loose and not, you know, blah, blah, blah. And at the same time, we're, you know, People with that perspective are also the ones who are handicapping ATF and doing something Correct. about gun dealers. And so, Correct. you know, it, it's a little bit hard to put that together in any sort of principled way. Yeah. Um, I think to get directly to your question, uh, if you, uh, Bill Bratton, the police commissioner in New York City and then Los Angeles and then New York City again and maybe Los Angeles, he goes back and forth, wrote an article in um, maybe a year ago uh, outlining a new philosophy that I think a lot of police departments around the country are starting to think more and more about, which he termed precision policing. And I think the, the, the basic idea behind precision policing is to try and make better use of data to be more surgical in police enforcement in cities. So to do a better job of targeting the enforcement that does happen um, on those people and those places that uh, where gun violence is most likely, and to also use data to try and drive changes in police behaviors in ways that improve relationships with the community. To, um, if you look at the national conversation, you would think that that's a little bit of a pipe dream. You would think that there's some intrinsic uh, tension between trying to improve relations with the community and reducing gun violence, but. I think, you know, for me, one of the really in interesting case studies is the LA experience, where over the last 30 years, we've seen big drops in homicide rates in LA, much larger than what we've seen in, in Chicago. Los Angeles is also one of the few cities that does regular opinion polling, asking people about their level of trust and support in the police department. And that's been steadily increasing over the same 30-year period. Now, there's no guarantee that we'll be able to do the same thing in Chicago, right? So there's, it's, that doesn't happen automatically, but I think it is a very uh, intriguing and suggestive data point for what is possible if we can you know, get this, this combination of policing strategies and reforms right. Thank you. Tanya Zacherson, Associate Professor of Surgery. I'm one of the trauma surgeons here, and I applaud everyone here for being here in the audience as well as being panelists. Um, I think it's very difficult to talk about the issue of gun violence, and everyone has been alluding to this, so it's, it's very inspiring to hear, without talking about the issue of structural violence. And my colleagues here from the Trauma Center will be talking about that. Because for our patients coming in, the extreme economic marginalization that we see, the systemic racism that they're facing day to day, is absolutely a contributor to the gun violence 
My question, however, is moving from a legal or a policy or even public health framework to one of a human rights framework vis-a-vis -vis firearm or gun violence. Amnesty International, International, interestingly, since 2016, has been releasing reports about firearm violence in the United States and how that's a violation of human rights and also UN conventions on the right of the child, women, economic um, stability and whatnot. And they also call for reparations for survivors of gun violence because this is a failure of our federal government and maybe local government any time a man, woman, or child is shot in this country. I was wondering if anyone has any ideas about class action lawsuits that could go forward on behalf of our patients or survivors of gun violence or maybe, I think the Brady campaign, Chris, maybe you've had experience with a variety of different class action lawsuits and maybe you can comment on that. Thank you. Thanks for the, the question. Um, there are a variety of lawsuits that Brady has been a part of with various legal theories, some of which are class actions. Of course, those are tough to bring based on the standards for moving forward with a class action, made, made even more challenging or especially challenging because of the existence of PLACA, um, which seeks to give gun manufacturers and dealers immunity. We have poked holes significantly in that, and you do see a number of new legal theories put forward that are challenging sort of the basis of that kind of immunity, including the case that was brought forward and ultimately has succeeded so far on behalf of the Sandy Hook families, which is um, moving forward on the basis of an unfair trade practice claim. There have been cases uh, that have been brought historically. Um, we represented the NAACP, for example, in a case about a decade ago, um, making claims related to the disparate impact of gun violence. And I predict that there will be more cases like that um, to challenge uh, the, the, the basis of this kind, kind of disparate impact, which is very clear and obvious from the evidence. The real issue is whether any of those kinds of challenges survive dispositive motions in court. Um, Congress has not made it easy for us. That's just the reality. So unfortunately, I think that we're out of time, although there are clearly a lot more questions that people would like to pose. So I think there'll be a chance to chat over the break. And I thank you all for being here. And please join me in thanking our panelists.